Hi, uh, my name is Zorzala. I go by my last name, just so that we get that out of the way. I'm here to speak about JuiceBerry, which is some sort of a library that would allow you to leverage juice for your tests. Um, I am the creator of that. Uh, I owe the work to that I did to many other people, you know, everyone from Kevin Burillian who's in the audience to Ro Furnica who did a prior version of a prior incarnation of this, which is the test service injector, our intern Danka Karvanska, which which who did most of the grunt work of the first shot, and many of the other people that have encouraged and allowed and encouraged me to adopt and adopted it on their own products. This is currently already in use uh, in several different uh, Google projects. Uh, AdWords 3.0, Old School AdWords, Moneta, Shards, AdSense maybe, Paul? Um, yeah. And then in, in the team of New York for alerts, I believe. Um, I, this is a, an adaptation of a talk that I will be giving at Uppsala. It, this is all public information. I actually I checked the box to make this video available on YouTube. Don't say anything proprietary. There shouldn't be anything in my slides that's proprietary. If you have questions at any time during the talk, you raise your hand, you can ask the question. If it's a very quick question, you just ask it out loud, I'll repeat it and I'll answer. If you have something that you want to say and elaborate on, please, at any point in time, you walk to the microphone, I'll stop, I'll give you the chance to speak so that I don't need to repeat that so that it gets registered on the microphone. Without further ado, oh, uh, so since it's an adaptation of a talk, the talk that we were giving Uppsala actually spends uh, a lot of time talking about juice itself and then it goes into Juiceberry. Um, I wanted to get a temperature feel in here. How many people in the audience do not feel reasonably comfortable with juice itself? You raise your hand. So we got only a couple of people in there. I will zoom in through the part that covers juice. It covers it under a unit test lenses, which allows us to give a backdrop to the application test eventually. But if you have questions regarding that, you please feel free to, to interrupt me as well. Um, and the, the lens, uh, the unit test lens application that I'm going to be showing, you know, con it's it's backdrop with a, a biller shopping cart and a unit test for those two things. I'm actually borrowing from slides that Jesse has kindly prepared from another presentation from Google I.O. and Crazy Bob had also done that, did some adaptations to those as well. Um, I'm going to, again, zoom in through the three different approaches, going to show how the code would look like before Juice came in, how the code would like uh, with manual dependency injection, and then uh, the by using juice on top of the manual dependency injection in there. So imagine that we have an interface of a biller. We have a real implementation of that biller. It's a Google checkout biller, very simple thing. And then we have a fake implementation of that, which is useful for us uh, to test. That's all about testing, Juiceberry. So if we have our old school factory singleton method in there, static method factory, we would have a private static final biller instance somewhere and a way to acquire that statically from a biller factory. Everybody has seen this code a million times, more than what we wish we had. And then we would have a shopping cart. The shopping cart needs a biller. What it would do is would say, OK, biller factory, please give me an instance of that biller. And I actually try to take, the, take care throughout the slides. Whenever we call a static method, I italicized it just like your ID would so that you know it's bad. Um, this, is, this is the dependencies in there. Your shopping cart depends on your biller factory. That depends on your instance of the biller. That depends on the biller. Um, now, if we want to test this stuff, there's a couple of compromises that we need to make. Because if we want to unit test the shopping cart, we need to be able to replace the real biller by a fake implementation of the biller. So out goes the final word on the private static in there. And in comes a method set instance, which probably we annotate, at least in Google, with add visible for testing. right? And then that's your test shopping cart test in there. The blue part is my actual tests. The black part is the scaffolding around that. It's the JUnit scaffolding at the beginning. Declare the method. And then the biller factory dot set instance, also italicized with my fake biller. That allows me to, to test, to unit test that class. 
Sure enough, there is a problem with this, of course, because as soon as I set the instance of the biller, all of the other tests that come after that will get my fake implementation of the biller, not exactly probably what I want to do. So my test would also have to do some setup and tear down in there where it stores in a private variable the previous version of the biller, and then it sets the previous version, the original version, uh, on its tear down. Who has seen code that looks exactly like this? Everybody. Okay. Uh, so Kevin B has created this nifty thing. Okay, so the, pro the larger problem with this is that if some exception happens and some more tear down in there, then the biller is never tore down. The, it's not restored with the other you know, version that he had before. Kevin has created the, the class that is very familiar to Googlers that do Java. It's called the teardown test case. It allows you to put that teardown code in the setup as individual parts. So it will guarantee to at least do that. It's all scaffolding, all of this stuff that allows me to create the test. Now, the factory observation, of course, the test must pass the fake to the service and clean up afterwards. There is a compile time dependency from the test onto the Google Checkout. There is a runtime dependency on the Google Checkout Builder. Even though we never use it, hopefully the constructor of that beast doesn't do anything expensive which is not as very likely. But you know, we, have, we actually create an instance of Google Checkout Builder even though we never use it. Right? And then reusing the shopping cart in another context that's different uh, from, from the one that we originally intended for is very hard because in the I language, in dependency injection language, the shopping cart is coupled to the Google Checkout Builder. We saw the code in there. So how do we fix that by hand? We have constructor injection is my favorite kind of injection. Hopefully, it's yours as well. You pass a biller to the construction of the shopping cart. You make it a private final. It's immutable. You never change it. It allows me in my test to create an instance of the shopping cart by passing my fake. There's no setup or teardown required. Um, and this is the code that it looks before and after. The entire scaffolding of the setup is gone. And that red line of biller factories dot set instance is also gone and I didn't lose any functionalities. It's exactly the same test, only better. And uh, the question is, where does the my dependency go? Dependency goes onto the shopping cart factory. Then the shopping cart factory knows how to create a shopping cart by creating it, by calling the biller factory got, get instance and returning a shopping cart in there. In a, de a dependency injection model would be to push the dependencies from the core of the systems to the edges of your code as far out to the edges of your code that they are, uh, that they can be. And this is the new diagram. The shopping cart doesn't depend anymore on the Google Checkout Builder, so it doesn't either compile time or runtime depend on the Google Checkout Builder. And what depends on that is a Google Cart factory. Now, of course, the manual dependency injection has the, all the, you know, it turtles all the way down sort of problem. If you, if you have a factory now that is used somewhere in your code calls the shopping cart factory, you get another factory to create that, and another factory to create the class that creates that, and so on and so forth. And this, of course, is where uh, Google com uh, Juice comes in handy. I'm going to skip a couple of slides, which again are more targeted to, to Juice itself. Because um, writing all of these factories is tedious, blah, 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 blah. This is how you do it in Juice. You configure your interface to be bound to your implementation, and you have at inject flag to inject your, your biller in your test, uh, or sorry, in your production code. And from there on, um, the billing module is the thing that really depends on everything. I have this nice diagram, which, which for me is conceptualized how I, I view the system. On the right-hand side, I see that the four different master layers from this particular prism that exist at the bottom, we have the interfaces. Uh, sorry, I, I actually should have flipped this, but I'm not very good with that OmniGraffle. But the interfaces, then we have an implementation of the interface. We have the modules that, depends, that depend on those uh, real implementations. And then we have applications that pick a collection of these modules together. Likely, your application is itself a juice module that basically just picks a collection of other modules and says, I am an application. I can be started. right? And the, the, the point in here is the test in juice looks exactly like the test with manual dependency injection, just like it, as it should be. Okay. Uh, now, 
now this is the, the meat part in there that provided just a backdrop for me. We're gonna go into application testing. And when I say application testing in there, I wanna differentiate that from unit testing. Application testing is also referred to as functional testing. There's a, a number of other names for that. Whereas unit test is a white box. I'm interested in, in, in a code branch, and I, I used to say an if statement, an if path, really. One test tests one if path in one method in one class. That's a true unit test, right? Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we have an application test. It doesn't really care what the code looks like. Sometimes you can, you can refactor your entire class or swap it for some brand new implementation. The test might not need to change at all because what it's interested is how the code is perceived by the end user. It's black box, it pretends by and large to be an end user. It clicks through the UI and it asserts things that it sees in the UI, whatever the UI may be. And the case commonly in here is like a, a web UI as a browser. Um, so this is how my application then would look like. Um, in the bottom part is in black, uh, the parts that go into production, right? Including the, the part of the, our user using this, the, the, our application. We have a biller. We have our server our application that talks to the biller. We have a Firefox instance that talks to our server. On blue on the top part. And there we have the stuff that we need for our application test. I'm using Selenium in here for, for, to, to drive this because it's just uh, like the de facto standard that we use in Google. It's a very nice tool that allows us to drive our applications to drive Firefox, right? So there's a, my, my test code all the way in the top, and then it drives a Selenium RC that drives the application. And so imagine that this is sort of the tests that I want to write. There is, um, I need to create a user for the purposes of the test. I log in as that user, then I click to buy an item named Iguana. Um, then I enter a particular credit card number, I click on the submit button, and I assert that I'm visiting the submit OK page. Who has seen a test that looks somewhat like this in nature? Has done everybody, most everybody has done application tests before, right? This doesn't care what the code looks like, it cares what the user perceives when they click through the application. This is a, it's a test scenario, right? Now there are two things in here that I am omitting and I'm gonna go into more details in the next slides to provide sort of the, the comparison between uh, how it looks like without JuiceBerry and with JuiceBerry. And the two things is how do I get an instance of the tools that I need? How do I get, I, if I need to use Selenium to log in, to click a button, to do something, I actually need to acquire an instance of the Selenium class, right? And then how do I bootstrap the environment? How do, in the beginning of my test, I fire up my server, I put all the pieces together that allows me even to get started testing things all together. So I will start with the blue, the first item. How do we get an instance of Selenium in this class in here? Well, okay, so we could have in there a private Selenium Selenium and in its Selenium method that's called from the setup method. Setup method would uh, start the server first and it would initialize the Selenium. And after we initialize Selenium, then we're free to, to use Selenium to open the login page and log in as our user. Yeah, okay. So there are two things that I wanna point out about in this slide, which, which are, first, let's imagine that you would like to have all of your tests uh, sharing the same instance of Selenium, for example. All of your tests in all of your test cases. And even more so, more importantly, that login method that exists in this test, and here is useful probably for more than this one test case. It's something that you're gonna use in pretty much all of the tests that you write for your application, yes? So, so speak it out. How do, you, how do you make this code more reusable for other tests in old school JUnit? You create a superclass. How did I know that? Because it's the only thing the JUnit lets you to do. You create an abstract class, my Selenium test that extends test case. You have a setup method, you push your setup method to that, you push your Selenium up there, you push your private, private, public login, <coughs> avoid login method into there. And then you make your Selenium, of course, static because you want that same instance to be shared for all of the tests and in your init Selenium method you check whether it's no, and if it's no, you create one, otherwise you just use the one that you have already done before. Who has seen code that looks exactly like this? 
Okay, again, pretty much everybody that pretty much has done application tests has seen this. Now, uh, I should have waited until I flip my, my slide to the next. What are the problems that you see with this slide in here, if any? Just if there are no problems, then I can go home. <laughs> Okay, so one problem is subclass after subclass after subclass. All of the different things that you might want to do in there, you have to fit into a class hierarchy which can grow up to be a monstrosity like an old school of extends functional test case if you ever want to have a lot of fun with class hierarchies. Just look at that one. Okay, another problem with this. Sometimes a server can be configured, you might want to configure the server in different ways for different tests. We're going to get to this later. I'm still stuck on, on problems on this slide in here. What did you say? You never shut down the server, you never shut down Selenium. That, that's one thing. This, like, I'm thinking, OK, it's cheap, because you know, even if I keep these things forever on JVM exit, hope there is going to clean up all of the resources, and that's fine. I have other peeves with that. The peeves that I have in here is, of course, there's a static Selenium. We do dependency injection. We don't like to see the word static in our code. That's fine. Inheritance is really the only choice in JUnit, as we were saying before. That, that's a very well taken point. Now, uh, three other points that are more interesting in here is that that test really is like a kitchen sink test. Everything that you can possibly imagine that you can possibly ever want in any of the tests in your application has to be in that one class. Right, and I'm, I've seen code that looks exactly like this. Hundreds and hundreds of methods that have nothing to do with you, but someone else in a team that is sort of kind of like uh, the same team as yours needs that they dump into the same class or in parent, you know, in other classes in the same class or work. It's a kitchen sink, right? The other thing that we don't actually get to think about when we write our test, just because JUnit made our brain so dumb, is that there is also compiled, dependence, compiled time dependency on what is really a runtime dependency. My test has nothing to do with the default Selenium implementation of Selenium, but there is a compiled time dependency to it. Um, it's, it's even hard for me to state it this way because we're so used to cleaning up our production code and then we end up with the tests that still do all of the coupled evil stuff that we cleaned up the production code. We don't even think about that because we can't quite think of how to, to fix that. That was one of the peeves that motivated me to, to go into uh, writing Juiceberry. It's like I underwent all of this effort to clean up all of my static code and my factories and stuff from production. And suddenly I ended up with test code that looked a lot worse than my production code. And that didn't make sense to me, right? If it's test code, I ought to care about that. And of course, all parts are coupled together. Um, that's going to come back when Peter? Peter? OK. And when we go back to Peter's point in there. So how do we fix that with Juiceberry, right? This is sort of the same test written in Juiceberry. It extends from, uh, I chose to extend it from a, a base Juiceberry JUnit test case is packaged for you. It's, all, it's as good as extending from teardown test case or even test case itself. You just need to call uh, Juiceberry.setup in your setup method. That's pretty much what that class does for you. It really doesn't need to extend from your own abstract base class. Um, and it can have a login bot injected into this class. And that login bot can be used to log in as a user. And the first line in the code that you see in blue in there is just declaring that the environment that glues all of these things together is called my env. OK, you parse this slide. OK, my login bot is just a random Pojo class in there that is injectable, has an injectable constructor, uses constructor injection to get an instance of Selenium. And it does exactly what the method I put in the superclass in the other example does. It just does selenium.open for a particular URL based on the Selenium. Right? I, I'm going to say this multiple times in, the, in this presentation. is just like your production code looks like. The intent of Juiceberry uh, is if you have juicified your production application, your test code will look just like your production code looks like. And this is, this is your end. This is a juice module. I chose, again, to make it extend from this Juiceberry JUnit 3 env in there, which gives me 
uh, it installs one basic JuiceBerry module which knows how to deal with, te with injecting task cases and understands task scopes. But basically, this is just a, a module, a juice module, an abstract module, where I can bind Selenium to a Selenium provider in Scopes Singleton. And that Selenium provider is just a class that has the code that we had in the superclass, again, that knows how to create Selenium based on a default Selenium. OK, clear? Questions? No questions? OK. So the issues now are solved. The ones that I pointed at least, the ones that I rigged this to, to point out to. There is no more static Selenium because just like in your production code, uh, your singleton is dealt with as a scope.singleton. In fact, um, scopes.singleton is not the, the scope that I generally use for my Selenium and my application. I actually make them thread local because it allows me to run tests in parallel. I just need to change that one. Uh, scope declaration in there to be thread local scope. Uh, inheritance is not the only choice anymore. DI, particularly Juice, is one of the things that I love about Juice. It encourages composition a lot. So I can, I can break down the parts into as granular uh, of things as I want, and I would just inject things that I actually care to inject, to inject and have available in my test in there. My kitchen sink test then doesn't even exist, so it can't grow unboundedly large. There's a separation of concerns. As I say, the different parts are, are granular, and they can take care of the things that they know how to do very well. And uh, there's no compile time dependency to anything anymore except the things that affect the interfaces, just like in your production code. Uh, our test doesn't depend on the default Selenium anymore. Um, and all the parts are not coupled together. The coupling, just like in your production code, happens in your Juice module, in your application. A JuiceBerry env, if you, if you think about the slide that I showed all the way back there, is like an application. It, it's an application that, is com that comprises multiple Juice modules. They're put together in there, and that's all where all of the pieces are coupled together. OK. Up. OK, so there's all sorts of fun things that I can do now. Right with my test, I, in, and again, this looks eerily like uh, code that I actually have written in my prior, you know, stint with the billing team in here. Uh, this is a different test. It tests the declined credit card transaction in there. I said in the beginning that the tests pretend, by and large, to be end users. Sometimes they actually are, it's convenient for them to be able to access some backdoors in the system. So they can help our test infrastructure know that we are testing a scenario other than the only scenario that they support. So in this case, our, our fake implementation of the biller can look at that and be told, OK, when you get the next request, you please decline that transaction. That's the, the fourth blue line that you see in there. And then I can assert that I'm visiting the, the credit card decline page. And that because I can inject the biller controller in here that I, I can acquire in any particular way that I want, and so on and so forth. If you look at the code that, that uses JuiceBerry, you're going to see that classes get a lot of things injected, or however many things they actually need in order to operate. You see it also that even though I use Selenium in this class, the Selenium just like in your production code, is a dependency of a dependency of mine, right? It's a dependency in this case of the login bot. So I don't inject Selenium into it, I inject Selenium into the login bot and the login bot into this. Just like in my production code. So the second part that I wanted to talk about, I'm gonna revert to the stinky old world of JUnit without JuiceBerry is how to bootstrap this entire thing, right? We talked about how to acquire instance of your Selenium. Uh, but how do we bootstrap this application? I'm going to get to Peter's point in a second. Um, we have a Selenium class that now I expanded the start server portion of the setup in there uh, that does a start a builder. Of course, I, before I start my application, I need to start a builder. Uh, I build a set of arg arguments to my application where my arguments point to the address of the builder and local host, port one, two, three, four, and off I go. Now, I don't want to transform this into a, a, a self-est or an indictment or anything about, about a, you know, swapping out real for fake implementations. But I honestly have found very useful to have 
the ability to, to run my applications against fake major systems that are external to my application. So in this case, for example, I would very much like to be able to, to test my application by and large against a fake builder. Because bringing up a builder is expensive. I don't want to do that in my environment, in my development environment. It may, drop a hint in here, it may need a version of my SQL that's not compatible with the version of my SQL of my production code that lives in my development environment. So it can be a hassle. It's not quite the word that I'm looking for to, to set it up. So by and large, I'm interested in running my tests against the fake because by and large, I'm interested in, in testing my code. And ultimately, I'm also interested in knowing whether it actually works. But I'm, by and large, I'm interested in testing my code. And the code that I wrote is not the builder, not in this case. Um, so again, uh, if we can modify ever so slightly my first slide in there, we're going to see in the bottom in there that I can have my server talking to a real builder or have an in-process fake builder installed in my server that would allow me, it would be a fake that is that is not one of those simple, you know, testing on the toilet condor things. They're very simple fakes. This is like a very capable fake that can pretend to be the real thing uh, as far as my application test is concerned. Um, and then I would have, say, a static a system property in there that I can say. Again, by and large, I'm interested in testing the fake builder. So this code says, by default, please use the fake builder. But if I want to run my test against the real builder, an integration test, then I can actually run that test against the real builder. And that's how the code would then look like. Very simple. Okay, I put an if statement in there. If I use the real builder, then I start the builder. And if I use the real builder, then I configure the builder address to be that. Otherwise, I just tell my arguments that they are to be run against, that that server is to be run against the fake builder. Who has seen code that looks like this? Okay, most people, again, have seen code that looks exactly like this. Now, the problem with that, it comes back with a vengeance in there. Um, where my kitchen sink test not only grows unboundedly large, but it grows unboundedly complex in its setup code for all of the possible combinations of all of these fakes, because my system might depend on five external systems in there. And it not only compiles, uh, it, it, the, the compile time dependency to this runtime dependencies that he has, it really is a union of all of the possible fake and real implementations of all of the external systems. So not only I didn't make matters better, I made them worse by introducing the fake because I need to compile more stuff. I need to compile the real builder and the fake builder and the real login authentication server and the fake one and so on and so forth. And the coupling, uh, Peter, as your point right there, there's a combinatory explosion of all of the possible different ways that my system can be set up for all of these possible external systems. OK, now if we go back into JuiceBerry, we remember that the only link between this and a particular application is at the at JuiceBerry env annotation. Happens reflectively in there. It's pointing to my env. My env, other than the stuff about Selenium, would have, say, would have something that looks like this, where it configures, by default, the biller to be tied to a provider, a fake biller provider in Scope Singleton. Then what I am free to do is I create a brand new environment. It has nothing to do with this, not extend that. Doesn't, it doesn't compose. Doesn't, it's just a different environment that says it's an integration environment. It's another application. I can configure the same builder then to point to a real builder provider. Remember, my test only knows about builder. It doesn't know about the fake or the real builder in there. And then what JuiceBerry allows me to do, this was built in from the get-go in JuiceBerry. It allows you to, to tell JuiceBerry, you know, I had a change of heart. When I said that I wanted you to use my env, I actually really meant you to use my integration env. So you could get your same test case running against your fake and your real builder whenever you wanted them to without increasing the complexity of your setup code in there. And this is how you do it. You install a remapper. You install a remapper through a system property. 
A remapper can be as fancy as you want. It takes a test case and a just very end name as arguments to the remap method, and it needs to return a string, which is the name, fully qualified name of a class, which also needs to be a just very end. That's all the remapper needs to do. I mean, there's all sorts of fancy things that you want to do in there. In this case, it does something very simple. We say, okay, this remap remapper remaps anything that it receives to be my integration environment. I actually commonly create a static method in the classes, in my remapper classes that can do that sort of stuff programmatically, like the grayed out stuff in the bottom in there. Um, but it's the same thing as passing a minus D property to, to my test run. Um, this, this is being used by different teams in here, but teams that use JuicePerry in order to be able to run their application, uh, sorry, their integration, their integration tests. And the way that you do it, it's something like this, right? You have an all tests suite that runs your regular tests, and before running that, those tests, you just set the system property to be integration. So then what JuicePerry does is whenever it finds the annotation in there, JuicePerry end, right early in the process, it's, it looks so say, oh, there's, a, there's an installed remapper in here. Might have had a change of heart. Asks the method, method returns a JuicePerry env, it installs that and, and it can use that JuicePerry and it will use that JuicePerry env instead of the one that you have in there. Now this is the only sort of like advanced-ish feature that I'm gonna cover in here and it's pretty much I am at the latter end of my talk, but I do want to get some feedback from something I probably went too fast. I will have more questions in the future, but everybody is looking either everybody understood everything or nobody understood anything. <laughs> it's a very dangerous place to be. So there is a tutorial in in JuicePerry, it talks about all sorts of other things, and we have a lot of time. We can, I can briefly mention a few of the other things that it can do, uh, like test scopes and test scope listeners, and God forbid, even uh, controllable injections, which is very cool, but very complex to, to explain. There's a tutorial step by step. It's all functional. You can run the tests in there, you know, and, um, and that's, that's pretty much it. So um, I'm open for questions. There ain't no questions. There ought to be a question. Thank you. Uh, silly dumb question. So if you end up in a situation where your server takes a long time to start up on the order of five to six minutes, yes. is there any other mechanism than implementing something like a global scope for providing a singleton of that instance across multiple test runs? So essentially a, a, a long-lived juicer environment that lives across multiple test yeah. class executions. I, I don't think I made myself very clear, so, so it's good that you brought that up. That singleton scope in there will live for the duration of, for a very long duration, for pretty much, if, if the code is written the way that it is, it will live for the duration of your test, uh, of your JVM. Uh, what JuicePerry does is this. It finds, whenever it finds a new JuicePerry env, something that it has never seen before, it will go and it will create an injector for that guy. And then it will hold on to that injector uh, throughout the life cycle of your JVM. And it will use the same injector. You can actually, you know, that's exactly what this does, right? It creates, starts a server. It keeps that instance of the server alive forever <coughs> for as long as you want. You can create a fancy scope. Is that for, new? Yes. Is that new? No, no, this has always been from the very beginning. It's always been exactly like this. In fact, if you see the code from our old school Lofi, I created something ever so slightly more elaborate than a singleton scope because what happens is we needed to run both Offi and ICS tests. And Offi and ICS, they need DPL static states to be different from one to the other. So what I, what I ended up doing, I, I have a mutable singleton scope. Don't, don't throw things at me for that name. It's a mutable th singleton scope where, where the, t the server will be started once. Um, I will run all of my Offi test and it will be shut down. Uh, I have a test that then tells the scope to shut itself down and then the next test will go ICS and, and they would 
they would do that. So it, it has always been exactly like that. The injector is preserved preserved forever. If you have multiple declared at use spare ENs, or if you use the remapper or something, all of those injectors that get created, they stay alive for the duration of your JVM. That's exactly how it operates. Yes, Russ. An environment uh, sets up a real filler instead of a fake filler. How is that uh, torn down at the end of the series of tests? If an environment set up a real filler as, you know, as opposed to a fake biller, how is that torn down at the end of the test? Again, so there are two answers. There's the cop-out answer. By and large, what you want is just to have that reclaimed. When your JVM exits, right, so it reclaims all of the resources that way. You can, and again, that's what I was describing that I, that I had the need to do, uh, clean up by you know, telling the system that a particular scope, they say, that my biller really is not a singleton. It's something that can be terminated. That's the mutable singleton scope, right? You can declare that that scope is finished. It's not the cleanest, most beautiful code out there, but it's the better choice if you have to live in a world where you have static state that conflicts with something that comes after that, and then you can shut down your server. You can do anything that you want. Shutting it down is actually rather reasonably simple. Just finding out when to shut down, you just need to, to have your test. If you, if you structure your test suites in certain way, you can actually tell JUnit, you can know, OK, at this particular point, I'm not going to need the biller anymore, and I'd like for you to, to shut it down. It's, it's possible to do it this way. Question in the microphone. Yeah, um, I'm just wondering if it would make some sense to do something similar to this in Python. Python? Mm, no. No, but... <laughs> <laughs> I... No, I, I... Dependency injection in Python, we create juice first in there, I guess. The concepts are applicable, but I, I have no... The, if, if anything, there are two... There are three major topics that are pending in my head, and none of them is Python. One of them is, is extending this for like JUnit 4, which right now is only supported JUnit 3. It's extending this to support test NG. If anyone is a test NG uh, aficionado in there, I'd love to get your input. Most of the code is not dependent on JUnit, uh, except the parts there are, which is a very small package. And then doing some other, you know, more declarative ways for me to, to, to start the server in the beginning. That's a long request from Jesse Wilson sitting on the juice row. We have the juice row in there. Kevin, Jesse, and Crazy Bob sitting on the same row. Don't nuke that row or we're, we're all dead in here. So um, just to clarify, I mean, it's not on your list of priorities, but I mean, do you, do you think that it would be a bad idea or just totally unnecessary? I have never written a Python program. I have never tested a Python program, so I'm in a very poor position okay. to, to make any judgment in there. If you write Python code and you like the stuff and you see that there are similarities, I, you know, I, I feel free to, to drop by in my room or give you spiritual advice, as I used to, to ask for <laughs> Kevin. Spiritual advice as to how to do this. The principles are very simple. In fact, this is something that I tried very hard. Juiceberry is very simple. It's very small. I tried very hard for it to be as stupid is the word that I'm looking for as possible. It is all in all, the core of the thing with all the frills and stuff, the core of the thing is not more than 250 lines of code. It's very small. It's juice. It's only juice. It's just this very tiny veneer glue of this juice and J units to bring those two very different things together. So the principles are, are transportable. There are cool things. There are other features that I haven't covered in here that could be applicable. But other than that, the, the, the code is out there. It's very simple to be copied if, if that is appropriate for Python. Drop by. Paul, how are you doing, man? Hey. So just answering the last question, I think Alex Martelli has a deck on uh, dependency injection in Python and testability. So go see him. Thank you, Paul. More questions? One cool thing that I'd like to mention while nobody steps up to, to the microphone in there um, is one of the things that I said in here. 
there is one of the native things that exists in Juiceberry, one of the very few things that Juiceberry adds on top of Juice is a test scope, of course, because it makes a lot of sense, right? You can bind something on a test scope, and then you can dereference and inject that many times throughout your test, and you're going to get the same instance, and your next test is going to get a new instance. There is an example of that in the tutorial where I bind, uh, have a binding to some you know, strictly incrementing counter, uh, an integer uh, notated with something to a strictly incrementing counter, and I show how it behaves differently. <coughs> if, you, if you don't bind it in any scope, if you bind it in a test scope, or if you bind it in a singleton scope, um, and this is something that is very well supported, and there it's, it turns out to be exceedingly uh, useful. Uh, actually, I would say if, if vital to the functioning of the system for that to exist. And uh, the other thing that I don't mention in the talk is a test scope listener. There is a way. <clears throat> um, there is a way for you to to do things that you might wish in setup and teardown without having to resort to abstract classes that you need to overwrite. Right? Uh, the the test scope listener allows you to to be told whenever a test begins and ends in a compositional sort of fashion. Just declare, okay, this is a test scope listener. Whenever it, there is a setup in your test case, there is an entering scope gets called. Whenever teardown happens, exiting scope is called. And that class itself can have all sorts of fun things injected into it. it it's very useful for certain applications. It's not strictly necessary in many other cases. If you, if you, if you don't do anything, you say, you're going to notice that in my code in there, and I actually <coughs> didn't cheat in that regard. Um, this is my test. It, doesn't have any setup code to actually start the server. Um, generally, what happens in there is, is that by injecting a login bot, you need a Selenium. To, need a, to get a Selenium, you need the address of your server. So the thing that knows how to give the address of your server is the server. The server, in order to give the address, needs to be started. So just like in regular production code, Dependency injection takes care of starting the server for you the first time around. Um, this can be made to, to work differently. You can, if you use uh, a test scope listener, you can cause it to eagerly start, even if you don't inject anything that depends on the server. You can trigger the server initialization. Again, something that Jesse wants is for me to have this be done in a more declarative manner, but uh, but it's it's it's. It's already supported in, with, with the scope listeners. More questions? KB. Uh, well, since we seem to have extra time, all right, did you want to try taking a stab at telling us about controllable injection? OK. Can I put you on the spot to the, attempt The one that? hour and a half question in here. So, <laughs> so here's the cool thing. Okay, So, so picture this. Uh, my favorite example is the geocoder. I'll drop, there's, there's nothing in the computer. I'll drop the, the clicker. Geocoder is my favorite example. Um, your browser talks to your web server. Your web server f extracts the IP address. Then it uses a database to map that IP address to a location in the world. So what, lots of Google properties and lots of things out there, nothing confidential about that. We, we do it, right? OK, which causes? All of your tests that you run here uh, to, to be told by the geocoder that they're running in Mountain View. Not very interesting, right? Particularly if you want to test things that are internationalized. And adding insult to injury in there, every time you start your server, if you use a real geocoder, you're going to read, uh, I'm not making these numbers up, 450,000 records from your database for all of the IP addresses and all of the locations in the entire world just so that it can tell you that you are in Mountain View, which you knew beforehand. OK, not very interesting, right? So what if you could, you know, what if you could tinker with that, right? In, in general, OK, let's say you, you swap out the real implementation so you don't have the insult added to injury in there. You have a binding from your geocoder service to something that always returns Mountain View. It's a, it's, a, it's a very simple stub in there. You still don't have an ability to go and 
modify that result. Uh, you want to test what happens to a customer in France or in, in French Quebec. Do they get the right locale in French you know, Quebec? Controllable injections. Controllable injections is this fun thing where you can get your, you can get your description of, of your juice modules. An application, an application is a collection of juice modules, right? You can parse that, you can feed that to something that tinkers with that ever so slightly, that you only have, it's testing only code, it's code that never sees the light of day in production. Modifies a few of the select bindings that you are interested in modifying in there. And it allows you to play man in the middle attack against your own code, or in favor of your own code, and as, as it may. Right? So from your test case, you would be able to, and Juiceberry supports all that. There's a lot, of, I'll, I'll talk about a little about the details, but the interesting part is you can inject something in your test, which is uh, an injection controller, and say, please control the injection for the geocoder and swap out the implementation for this implementation in here, create with an easy mock, or I don't know, create it with something else. And then, and then the server part of your code would look at that man in the middle that you have created, that you have told Juice Perry to, to put in place, you have t told Juice to put in place, really. Um, <coughs> if you have something that your test t told it to override, please do use that instead of what you would do otherwise, right? It's very fun. Um, this generally, without Juiceberry, without controllable injections, I must say, is dealt with by creating some sort of a, a static variable that your test, that in production you expect and you hope and you pray that it will always be null, right? So you write the factory by hand, it looks at that thing, whenever it's always null, it return. Um, the real thing, otherwise your test can go in there and tinker around with that thing and put some entry in there and return that. There's a few problems with that, including the fact that you're polluting your production code with test-only code and you pray that it will always stay null in production, and, and the fact that it's not thread safe. You cannot run your tests in parallel. There's a cool thing about Juiceberry, how it does controllable injections, is if you have five tests running in parallel, each of which can install their own controlled injection for a geocoder to say that they pretend to be in different countries altogether, they will not step on each other's toes. Um, that all happens by the principle is it, it uses a, a test ID, uh, which is basically the name of your test class, name of your method, and a random number, so you can run the same test in parallel with itself. So there's a test ID that, that, that you can use in your test end that matches a test ID and the server end that gets set through cookies. In the beginning of your HTTP request to set a cookie, say this is, this is a test and the test ID for this test is that. Your server side code looks at that cookie, then it do, does the right thing, it figures out what is the appropriate controllable injection. All of this is the mumbo jumbo. You don't get to see any of that, it's all packaged for you. And it, and it works, and it's being used already, KB. So let me see if I understand this right. Yes. So you're saying basically that you can start up a real production server yes. once, but you're starting it up in a sort of enhanced mode. Yes. And then your tests can send little messages to that server saying, I want to inject this little mock for you to use for the geocoder for my test, and then other tests can have it use a different one. And those tests can run in parallel, and they will get their own version. Right. Cool. This is controllable injection. It's very cool. It's it's twisted to to kind of wrap your head around. It took me a long time to to find, but it's actually rather very simply implemented. It's just a HTTP cookie that is set in there. More questions, please. Otherwise, we have ten minutes that we're done. Thank you, guys. Thank <laughs> you.